Hi, everybody. This is Kara Fitzgerald at New Frontiers in Functional Medicine. I would not be here month in and month out for the past six years without the generous support of our sponsors. And I want to tell you about them and please check out their websites and check their products out. Biotics Research. For over 40 years, the foundation of biotics research has been innovation and quality. Their goals remain unchanged. Innovative ideas, carefully researched concepts, and product development with advanced analytical and manufacturing techniques. Biotics nutritional products are of superior quality and effectiveness and available exclusively to healthcare professionals. Visit them at bioticsresearch.com. Integrative Therapeutics. Integrative Therapeutics is focused on inspiring a better lifestyle through better health. By providing meticulously formulated nutritional supplements and valuable resources, Integrative Therapeutics promises to enrich your patients and embolden your practice. Welcome to your Integrative Therapeutics. Find them at integrativepro.com. And finally, I want to give a shout out to my friends over at Rupa Health. They make lab testing easy, fabulous, doable for both you, the clinician, and you, the person being prescribed the lab, the patient. Consider using Rupa as just a super, super, super smart solution to all your laboratory needs. Visit them at rupahealth.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome to New Frontiers in Functional Medicine, where we are interviewing the best minds in functional medicine and beyond. And of course, today is no exception. I am Really excited to jump in with this woman, uh, Dr. Stacy Sims. But before I tell you about her and we jump into what's going to be an amazing conversation, I just want to give out a shout out to our lovely Diamond sponsors for taking good care of this podcast and just keeping it going throughout the years. Um, this is Rupa Health. Anybody who's uh, practicing medicine in the functional integrative space needs to check out Rupa Health because they make laboratory testing easy. They make the complex functional laboratory testing easy for all of us. Actually, for us as clinicians, for our support staff, as well as for our patients. That's Rupa Health. Check them out. There's a link in the show notes. And also Biotics Research. I've been taking, prescribing, recommending biotic supplements for years, and they've actually been around for decades. Uh, they just, they produce high quality products. Their designs are creative. My friend uh, and colleague, Dr. Alex Vasquez is involved in a lot of uh, their product designs and their, you know, their ingredients are really impeccable and high quality. Uh, so to both of my sponsors, thank you. Thank you. And thank you. All right. And now on to the podcast, let me tell you about Dr. Sims. She is a forward-thinking international exercise physiologist and nutrition scientist who aims to revolutionize exercise, nutrition, and performance for women. Amen to that. Uh, she's directed research programs at Stanford, at um, Auckland University of Technology, uh, at the University of Waikato, if I'm saying that right, you can correct me later. Focusing on female athlete health and pushing the dogma to improve research on all women. This is essential. At Stanford, she translated earlier research into science-based layperson's book, Roar, to explain sex differences in training and nutrition across the lifespan, challenging existing dogma for women in exercise, nutrition, and health. This paradigm shift is the focus of her famous TEDx talk titled, Women Are Not Small Men. Her vast contributions establish her as the premier expert in sex differences in training, nutrition, and health. And with that, she's repeatedly on top 10 lists of physiology and nutrition experts really around the globe. She's published a ton and she's still publishing. She's got 2023 publications out. She's prolific. Um, so in seven, more than 70 peer reviewed papers, um, she's written books, again, TEDx talks, et cetera, et cetera. She's a sought after speaker around the globe and really you know, focusing in the sports space. Uh, she's a senior research associate at Prince AUT University is on, and is on the advisory board of cutting edge companies and also runs her own business. And as we were just talking about, she's a mom as well. Stacy, Dr. Sims, welcome to New Frontiers. Oh, thanks for having me. I feel like we used up the entire time by you just reading my bio. <laughs> <laughs> You've done a lot. I mean, you've done a lot. Your career is extremely impressive. I am so glad to have found you and to be able to highlight you on the show because I know people are going to be very interested in your message. You know, fundamentally, women are not small men. 
you are an athlete and I'm particularly interested in, in, in this because, you know, I am an athlete too. And I, you know, I was competing in college. I don't anymore, but um, this got you on your career journey. So you were a rower, I believe in college and you started to observe differences between men and women and this led to your focus. I mean, just tell me a little bit about your story and how you came to that and what you saw. Yeah. Um, so I was always that kid that asked why. And when I got to university and was rowing and some of the things didn't make sense, I was also in ex-phys. I was like, okay, well, I'll ask there why these things are happening. And I kept getting the answer. Mm, it doesn't matter. You're just like men. And like in metabolism labs, being one of the only women that was fit enough to be crazy enough to do some of like the two hour runs on the treadmill and my results were different enough that they would throw them out or call them an anomaly. So now I was like, wait, wow, I'm the daughter of a military officer. I follow the standardization. I know how to follow the rules. So it just yeah. didn't add up. So as I started digging a bit more, I'm like, wait, there's nothing out there really for women. They, you read the textbooks and they always refer back to the cis man and even um, like medications and everything. It's all based on that standard 180 pound white man. And when you start looking at it, it's like, wait a second, you're telling me that I need the same things as a 130 pound woman, as a 180 pound guy. I just, just didn't make sense. So being inquisitive and pursuing more athletic things in my life, um, having the availability to go try to find those answers to apply to myself as an elite athlete and my teammates. And then when I stopped racing, being able to help teammates who became coaches and really trying to get people to understand that what we are now acknowledging as a status quo is not good enough for women because that research hasn't been done for us. And we've just been put in this little box and you can see it in the fitness world too. I mean, you see women who are constantly injured, overtrained, sick, and they're following the same kind of yeah. coaching protocols, nutrition protocols, and they're just not getting the results. And people, you know, say, oh, well, you're not doing it right. Or women blame themselves. I just can't do it. Um, I'm not good enough. And so it's that internal negative conversation that keeps pushing and pushing women to have self-doubt and not achieve what they can when actually it's the protocols and the protocols that are being applied and even the language and conversations that are around the fitness world and how to be strong and how to eat right. It's just developed out of this, you know, sport endeavor of aggression and power and infallibility, which is all those male traits. So it's been um, interesting over the past couple of decades to see how bad it's gotten. And now that we're having more of a global voice that, yeah, women are not small men and we need to do something about it. Seeing maybe in the past four years, this global uptake of, okay, it isn't good enough to treat our women like this. Let's look and see how we can treat them better. It's a liberating mm -hmm. statement. <laughs> women are not small men. It's really liberating. When I first heard, it was quite a while ago that I came up on your work and, 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 and that term, and I'm like, women are not small men. <laughs> It is. It's yeah. liberating. We're different. How are we different? So what did you observe? And then, you know, what's in the literature and, you know, what, what other questions are you, are you curious about? Like, how are we different? When you look outside, like growing up in that, from an academic standpoint in the sport literature, there really isn't anything that digs in. So being inquisitive, looking at other literature. And then when I was doing my postdoc with Marcia Stefanik and she was in the Women's Health Initiative and talking about all of these sex differences and stuff, start digging in. You're like, hey, wait a second, there are sex differences in utero, which is the identification of XX versus XY and how uh, you know, a male embryo is not as resilient to stress and starvation as a female and how those differences can be translated wow. after birth. And then you're looking at what's happening from, uh, you know, at the onset of puberty. And we're seeing that you have that expression, epigenetic expression of testosterone that makes boys get leaner and stronger, more aggressive. Um, their bones get stronger. They have different muscle fiber uptake. And then what happens with girls is their hips widen, their shoulders widen, their center of gravity changes, their body composition increases body fat, and they get their period. So, but no one talks about that. No one talks about how we should be treating our girls and boys differently around puberty to enhance functional movement, enhance skills, enhance our ability to run, to jump, to keep girls in sport, keep girls happy playing on the playground. So it's just all the way through from before birth 
And even as we look at the aging literature, because women don't age like men do in a linear fashion because we have peri and post menopause, right? right? So when you start really looking from that big picture, you go right back to basic biological research and go, hey, everything we know really, if we look at sex differences, but not only that, when we look at early studies, they're all male mice. And so that doesn't really translate. So you can really pick it apart all the way back to the beginning of actual scientific method and scientific design. Wow. It's so interesting. I mean, it makes sense that female embryos might would have better resilience because, you know, we're going to be carrying babies, you know, right. keeping keeping the population surviving. So just from like evolution 101, you could infer there may be some, you know, little extra that we've got at that time. But yeah, yeah you're right. I mean, our bodies change radically. I mean, I so I want to get, you know, I want to get to talking about peri and postmenopausal women, but I, I, I just have to ask you, how do we address girls, you know, moving through puberty and all of those changes that, you know, I'm, when you were describing it, I was just sort of flashing back to my own body changes and you don't want to move. I mean, when these changes are happening, when we start getting our periods and, you know, they're usually wonky and, um, and the hormonal it, it, shifts, which, yeah. As a mom of a 10 year old, I'm viewing, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I think part of it is the cultural part, right? Where culturally it's been so taboo to talk about having a period, right? And that stems from a long time of men not understanding it, women having to go to menstruation tents and all sorts yeah. of things, right? So trying to get it normalized and having girls understand that this is just basic physiology and it's normal and we need to talk about it. We need to be able to support it. And there are small pockets in the Western world that are having like um, free period products in the schools, but it's not until the high school, right? So we're starting to see more uptake in the high school, but it's the younger set. And so from a sporting perspective, that's the way I'm trying to enter it, where we look at girls and boys, you know, soccer or swimming or something like that. And you're starting to see these changes inherently where the guys or the boys are getting faster and the girls are kind of dropping off. So talking to the coaches saying, hey, let's look at the dry land training. Let's look at the functional movement training. And if we want to have progression in the girls, we have to let them understand that we need to do more functional training and understanding our mechanics because those are changing. Now for the boys functional training so they have control of these muscles that are getting bigger and stronger. And for the girls, it's functional training so that they get more control from a biomechanical standpoint. But in fact, it's pretty similar in the training. It's just Hmm. why we are doing it. So we get that education piece, it starts to normalize it. And if we're normalizing it in the sport environment, then it becomes normalized in the general environment because sport is such an icon for role models and how things should be done. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you are going to have a little more body fat or your body's going to move differently and feel differently. And yeah, your hips are wider and so forth. And that's all as it's supposed to be. You know, this right. Is who that's you why are. I love the Olympics, the Olympic cycle, because like ESPN always puts out a body image or a body issue and it's profiling all the different body types in all the different sports. So you have the availability to see what does a, a Olympic track cyclist look like versus an Olympic track runner, or what does a gymnast yeah, look like next to a, a heptathlon, right? So you see yeah. all these different successful body shapes and sizes. And yes. so being able to show not everyone fits into a five, seven, 110 pound frame type thing that we've been so conditioned from fitness and modeling stuff. And not every guy has to be you know, six foot tall and super muscly, right? Because there's so many different body types that are successful in these different sports. And, you know, for my yeah. personal journey, becoming a competitive cyclist, because I've got these large, you know, I've got legs that are fast twitch and, 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 and bigger was one of the, it was so liberating and validating to sort of see my body's purpose and that it it's good that it looks this way I my sister on the other hand was really was was actually like the five nine super slender model and I wanted that and I did a pre it, it was it took sport it took competing for me to get the body that I have 
and to recognize it as badass as it you know for what it was yeah, and it, exactly it was a really it was a huge it was a, it was a very important moment and I could see yeah. we could use this across you know with with girls and women uh, you know of all different body shapes I tried to explain that to my daughter because uh, a lot of her friends are more petite in stature than she is. She has really long limbs because both my husband and I have long arms and legs. And so does she. She wants to do gymnastics, but her center of gravity is different from all her little friends who are really good at doing handstands and, and, you know, round offs and that kind of stuff. So I'm explaining to her, Hey, it's, it's not that you can't do it. It's your body center of gravity and how long you are, isn't going to make you as successful in gymnastics as your friends who are smaller but let's look at soccer. Let's look at running. And so she's excelling in those things that match what her body's really capable of doing. And having me as a mom, I'm able to explain it. And so it's like that education piece, but it's right. It's like you find that that kind of niche where your body just loves to do what it does. And then you yeah. feel really powerful. It's exciting and it's liberating. And I think it's so important because as you said in the very beginning, we can internalize, like my body wasn't okay. I wanted it to be something that it wasn't. And, and it was a really important moment of truth for me to learn. And it sounds like for your daughter as well to begin to embrace who she is. Yeah. All right, I've got one more question that I want to jump on. It, it, one more question in this arena. So we see kids, and, and I think this is because I've just seen this in my practice, who are doing gymnastics um, and who have you know, very low body fat and become, you know, we see anemia pretty commonly. We see amenorrhea, et cetera. What are your thoughts there? Like, how are we addressing that? Um, again, it's, yeah, I'm like, where do we start? No. Um, so again, it's the culture, right? So we look at what is the culture within most of gymnastics It's training. Uh, you see girls who are six, seven years old and they're getting into five or six hour training days and they're very conscious of how they move and they're being told that they have to be able to be a certain look and have a certain flexibility. And so it's all about the body image. And in that it's a hard training. And when you start gymnastics so young and puberty starts, you, know, you start seeing some of the normal changes around eight years old. Here is big news. Great Plains Laboratory is now Mosaic Diagnostics. Mosaic Diagnostics is where functional medicine practitioners turn to reveal the complete picture of their patients' underlying illnesses through evidence-based diagnostic testing. Get to know Mosaic Diagnostics by visiting mosaicgiveaway.com. Licensed practitioners can enter to win Mosaic's Business Booster Giveaway. It's $875 worth of test discounts, supplements, free educational passes, and a one-hour massage for your self-care. Visit mosaicgiveaway.com for your chance to win. And so girls become very conscious that all of a sudden, wait, I'm not, I'm not as thin or as um, you know, compact as I was. So what do I do? And unfortunately, one of the almost automatic responses is to not eat because there's that association of calories in, calories out. It's still that undercurrent. I mean, I've been in different cultures where they're like, you need to not eat as much because you're putting on too much weight. And coaches will say this or they'll compare um, gymnast to gymnast. And it's like it, it's just that ingrained thing. Now, you know, with the whole athlete a documentary that came out and the whole inquisitiveness into USA gymnastics, the culture is being exposed. So yeah. we're seeing more and more of, we need to make sure our girls are healthy and we're yeah. seeing more uh, role models that don't fit that typical profile of a gymnast, which is fantastic. But again, it's making sure, sure that we teach coaches and we teach the girls how to stay out of low energy availability. And we need to fuel our bodies for what we are doing because we would not drive a car down the road on E and expect it to go fast, right? So it's using those analogies that people will understand. We have to fuel for what we're doing in order to get the adaptations. Yeah. If we're fueling and we get those adaptations, then we keep our body healthy. And parents, like we need to pay attention. I am going to be watching. I mean, I, I definitely want my daughter to, to be in, in sports. She's so super physical and active, but um, yeah, I'm going to be watching for those messages like a hawk. I mean, we'll yeah. change. We'll, we'll, I, I mean, I'm just not, 
Ugh, I don't even. Yeah, it, it, it's she's, she's still pretty young. It's not a it's not a, it's not a place that I'm excited about going, but I'll absolutely go there, you know, with her and make sure that, you know, she, she's in a healthy, a super healthy environment. You know, as yeah. you're doing with your daughter. I'm worried about the teen years and yeah. they're fast approaching. And I'm like, how much education and um, body positivity can I give in these early years that will carry through? Yeah, well, geez, we'll circle back. We'll circle back yeah. in a couple of years and have yeah. this conversation again. So now let's talk about women who are, you know, th- let's talk about the moms now in this audience. Yeah. Um, where let's let's look at maybe I, I, a few comments on on premenopause, but Perry Post, I want to just get into that about how we should be training. So the women, how should we be training? Um, yeah, I was going to say differently from men, but. You don't even have to go just there. Differently. How should we be training? Yeah. Yeah. As I said earlier, how we don't talk about puberty and how these changes are happening with our young girls. Well, no one really talks about what's happening in perimenopause, which is actually the other end of puberty where instead of hormones coming up, they're starting to go down. So if we look at estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, primarily estrogen and progesterone, they affect every system of our body, right? We have this, our, our receptor sites that affect are affected by these hormones. So when we start having this downturn of estrogen progesterone or a misstep in our ratios, we start having different signaling and we start losing sensitivity of our estrogen receptors. We start having gut microbiome disturbance because we don't have as much of the gut bugs to kind of metabolize the estrogen and stick it back out. Um, So there's so many of these changes that are happening internally. So if we look externally, what can we do to kind of support our body through this? We need to look for an external stressor that is going to apply the same kind of um, signaling for adaptation that our body will do without the use of the hormones. What I mean by that is if we look specifically at skeletal muscle, um, so we know that estrogen specifically is tied to the stem cell of skeletal muscle. And when we start having a downturn of estrogen, then we don't have as much satellite cell um, signaling. So this is why we don't, we start to lose lean mass when we hit perimenopause and it's harder to build mass. The other thing with it is estrogen is tightly tied to um, myosin, which is one of our protein filaments for muscle contraction. So we don't have enough estrogen or we have too much estrogen, then we have a misstep in how strong our muscles are contracting. And then the third thing that estrogen is responsible for is acetylcholine and how much acetylcholine is there to depolarize and and cause that muscle contraction stimulus. So if we're looking at those three really basic biological, physiological responses that estrogen is responsible for, then we have to look externally. Well, what do we do that's going to create a really strong muscle contraction that's not only going to keep those nerves firing how they should and activating those muscle fibers, but also give the signal that we need more muscle fibers. So this is where we look at resistance training, but we're not looking at our eight to 12 or 15 reps that everyone talks about hypertrophy. That's not what we're after. We're after a central nervous system response. We're after women to lift heavy. So that's that zero to six rep range with really good form because we want to have that external load that's a central nervous system response. So we're having the nerve come down and be like, oh my gosh, I have to recruit a whole bunch of muscle fibers to overcome this load. Not only do I need to have a really strong contraction, so I better get myosin on board. So I have to have more acetylcholine. So the body's prepping it all. But I also need to have more muscle fibers themselves to activate. So for lifting heavy, we're getting a central nervous system response that's going to create that adaptation rather than relying on estrogen to then stimulate the satellite cell and the myosin and the depolarization. So it's really looking like... How do we mitigate and, and create a training environment yeah. to create that stress that our body needs? Awesome. Are we anticipating, are we okay with some muscle loss during this time? Or do we want to be really fighting for maintenance? You know, to keep, it, to be, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So it's, you can definitely build. Like people are like, oh, I'm postmenopausal. Is it too late for me? I'm like, no, it's not. It's never too late. We just have to look at, at, in perimenopause, we have such a sympathetic drive because the body doesn't have as much parasympathetic response because we don't have progesterone coming on board. 
um, as much as we used to with more anovulatory cycles. And we have an uh, increase in our baseline of cortisol because the body is stressed and misstep in sleep. So if we take it from a lot of people are like, oh, I want to go to CrossFit and I want to go to these boot camp classes and I want to do these HIT classes and nothing's working for them. They're getting more tired. They're getting more um, tired, but wired, sympathetically driven. And it's not about stopping that and not about not progressing. It's looking at it and going, wait, it is not polarizing enough to create the responses I want. So again, we look at that heavy resistance training to create that muscle adaptation. It also helps with bone. And then from that cardiovascular standpoint, we need to look at really having high, high intensity, not this moderate intensity um, stuff like your 45 minute circuit classes or boot camp or spin class, or even some of the Metcon and CrossFit type classes. We need to look at, uh, 85 to 90% of your max for one to two minutes if you're doing high intensity interval training with adequate recovery so that you can do four or five sets of that. But specifically, we need to look at that super maximal sprint interval training where you're doing 100 to 110% for 30 seconds or less. Because if we're doing that top, top end, which is really, really hard, we have a follow through of growth hormone and testosterone responses, as well as a massive antioxidant response from that high intensity, yeah, which is exactly what our body needs when we're in pain. That's pause. fascinating. So we're turning the volume up big time. Wow. Intensity, so but not volume. We right, don't okay, want a lot of volume. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. So you can, okay, so when you're looking at um, like improving sleep, improving body composition, yeah. improving metabolic health, all of these things that start to have a, a misstep when we hit perimenopause, especially late perimenopause, we drop the volume and we're looking at two sprint interval or two sprint interval with one high intensity interval training. So longer um, intervals and two to three heavy resistance training sessions. But those sessions aren't long. The heavy resistance training might be 20, 25 minutes because you're going in, you're focusing on compound movements. So you're getting total body workout. And then you can follow it up with five to six 30 second sprints and you're done and dusted within 45 minutes. All okay, doing with- both doing both cardio, doing some hit plus doing resistance. Yeah, so you do resistance and then you follow it up with a hit or, or a sprint. Or you can separate them out if you don't want to spend that much time or you're like um, too tired from lifting to do proper sprint stuff. And it's not about spending hours and hours in the gym. It's being very purposeful, planning it out, going, hitting it hard and then recovering. And how many how many days a week are you doing this um, resistance protocol? So two to three times of, res- of resistance training. And then you have two, maximum two sprint interval training sessions or maximum three high intensity interval sessions a week. If you're, you know, bookending resistance training with some sprints, then you're taking care of two in one day. So it might be four days a week total. Some people are like, but I'm endurance. I love going out for my long walks. That's absolutely fine. And like as a ex cyclist, just like you, you know, I'm not competing, but I love riding my bike. It's not the bread and butter. It's my soul food, but my bread and butter is resistance training and interval stuff. Awesome. You're answering my questions. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> because I, yeah, that's my, that's my happy place being on my bike, you know. For, exactly. Yeah. Listening to podcasts, just kind of yeah. feeling good. You can do hit for sure, but um, I love it. So a, a, kind of a, a, a brief, maybe four brief chunks of intensity, resistance and, and, and cardio. Yeah. Here's a go-to for you as a cyclist. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, winter, winter training in the gym, you do, uh, deadlifts and squats. So you're doing maybe five by five deadlifts with three minutes between, and then you're going to go into two by, um, three to five heavy squats, finish that up, get on one of the, on one of the bikes and do your sprint interval training. So you're taking the fatigue from the lower body work and putting it into your cycling mechanics. But if you're not someplace where you have to be inside, well, you do your heavy, heavy lifting, and then you go out and you ride up a hill and then you're getting the intensity from the hill ride. And you're taking the fatigue from the deadlifts and the squats and putting it into 
the muscles so that they now have to learn how to fire when they're tired and get that activation for increased lean mass. I love it. I love it. It's great. Um, how would you approach this for the non-athlete? Now I'm thinking, like, I'm thinking about my mom who would be like, yeah, right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, but my, I, mom too. my sister or my sister for that matter. Yeah. How, I mean, what do we, what, how do you, what, how do you start on this journey? You could do the same thing, but just where you're at. I mean, yeah. So if we're talking about resistance training, heavy is relative, right? It could be that you're doing body weight stuff initially, but then you put a backpack on with a kettlebell in it. It could be a five pound kettlebell and then you work your way up. So then you're doing all of your body weight movements with a little bit more resistance. And this tends to work for so many people who are like, I don't want to go to the gym. I don't feel comfortable in the gym. But then you might find that, hey, I'm getting stronger and the backpack isn't working. So then maybe we're going to go outside with the backpack and we're going to do lunges up a hill. Or maybe we do our walk and we do our stairs or our hill. And at the top of the hill, we take the backpack off. We take the kettlebell out and we're doing sumo squats with the kettlebell. So it's being interactive with your environment and not making it overcomplicated by having people go to the gym into that very masculine environment if they don't feel comfortable. But yeah. resistance training is so, so important for yeah. women who are 40 and older actually for all women, but really, really important when we're looking at what's happening from a longevity standpoint, which of course, you know, and we're seeing more data come out for women who are in their 70s, 80s and taking them and doing them in circuits to increase resistance and increase lean mass. But instead of doing eight to 12, they're doing the relative to them heavy power training and they're getting better outcomes, not only from lean mass development, but better proprioception because their body has to recruit more fibers and be more spatially aware. So then if they step off the curb wrong, they don't fall and break their hip. They're like, whoa, I've got the balance to catch it. Oh, that's so fabulous. Great. Really great. Really inspirational. Are you, um, what are your thoughts on zone two training? So there's a lot of chatter here in the States about zone two, like it's just gotten popular with some, with some influencers and you, you're focusing on, on doing resistance and high intensity, layering it you know, happy activities, which were probably more zone two. Do you, do you, what do you think? Do we need to do that? Is it a priority for women? Not at all. So if we look at zone two, the main idea behind zone two is to increase mitochondria, increase mitochondria metabolism and efficiency. Women by the nature of, of XX, we are already born with more of the proteins within mitochondria for doing fatty acid metabolism. We also are born with more ability to handle oxidative stress. So if we're looking at what is zone two doing, supposedly increasing our metabolic flexibility, increasing our fat burning, increasing our mitochondrial responses, by the nature of being a woman, you already have that. We don't have to spend hours and hours on zone two trying to increase our aerobic functionality. And this is that whole, like, get really a bit frustrated when people are like, but so-and-so said so. And I was like, yeah, but it's a male coach following male protocols. And you have to understand that coaching is still about 20 years behind the science. It hasn't caught up yet. So if we're talking about mitochondrial development and all this aerobic metabolism, it's based again on the cis male. But if we look at women's muscle and women's muscle function, we fuel differently, even before we're in peri and postmenopause, by the fact that our bodies will rely on blood glucose and fatty acids and slightly tap and deliver muscle glycogen. And so the goal of zone two is not to tap into that liver and muscle glycogen, it's to really tap into the fatty acids, but we're already there. So there's so many sex differences that go into how our bodies fuel, how our bodies are aerobic, how our bodies are looking at mitochondrial development. And men should be jealous of women because naturally we're already there. So we don't have to do all that long stuff. What if we're a diabetic or what if we're, you know, pre-diabetic, then are we leading into some of these, these training regimens or are we still, you know, going with what you're outlining? Yeah. So when we're looking at some of the epigenetic changes that happen with a high intensity, we actually see that there's more of GLUT4 activation and translocation so for people in the audience, GLUT4 is a specific, um, I guess, protein gate within muscle that allows glucose to come in without the use of insulin. 
And we see estrogen again is tightly tied to it. So not only do we need to really focus on that high intensity for metabolic control and um, blood glucose control, but when we're younger and we're in that pre-diabetic or diabetic aspect, we always want to look at how are we gonna create this epigenetic change within the muscle to be able to use and pull in more of our blood sugar instead of using insulin. So again, it's looking at high intensity to create that stress where the body's like, I need more fuel right now. I don't have time to tap into fatty acid. I need that right now. So it creates this greater translocation to open up those GLUT4 proteins to pull more in. And then the response post-exercise is now you have more coming into the liver, more coming into the muscle, and it's less circulation. Yeah. I mean, I can, for many of us, I think we notice a little window where you kind of indulge in some carbs, I think, post, yeah. post-event, post because you're just really I'm more efficient. Exactly. Um, yeah. Awesome. Good news. Yeah. I mean, the whole zone two training did not exactly thrill me, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. No. No. Um, what else do I want to ask you? Okay, so then you're talking a lot about the changes in hormones and how we can actually, so we're dropping off, we're in perimenopause, so they're wonky kind of in perimenopause and then you know they drop off in menopause and postmenopause. Where are you at with hormone replacement therapy in this model? I mean, it sounds like you've just outlined a protocol for us to be able to move through it without HRT, um, but what about using HRT? Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I've got lots of thoughts on that because... Um... Because like I said, when I was doing my postdoc at Stanford, I was working with Marcia Stefanik and she was one of the PIs on the Women's Health Initiative that initially caused the scare of taking it all off. And what people didn't understand about the Women's Health Initiative is that it was done on late postmenopausal women. So women who were 10 plus years away from that one point in time of menopause. Whereas you look at like the UK Million Women's Study that was done early uh, postmenopause and late perimenopause women, completely different outcomes with menopause yeah. hormone therapy. So when we look at what it is, we have to realize that one, our body's not metabolizing these hormones the same as our natural state, right? So our endogenous hormones are metabolized differently from exogenous hormones. But menopause hormone therapy is a therapy and it is useful for getting through perimenopause into postmenopause, especially if you have really bad vasomotor symptoms, you have a sudden bone loss, so you're at risk for osteoporosis. Um, It's not good for body composition change. It does not stimulate lean mass development. It slows the rate of loss, but it does not naturally do what our endogenous estrogen used to do by creating muscle turnover and increasing lean mass. Hey there, listeners. It's your host, Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. I have a question for you. How much time do you spend ordering functional lab tests for your patients? I bet it's a lot. Ordering from multiple lab companies for hundreds of patients can quickly turn into hours of admin time. But there's a new way to order lab tests I'm excited to share with you. Rupa Health is a tool that lets you order from over 30 specialty labs in a single portal. You can order all the tests you normally do from companies like Dutch, Vibrant, Genova, and Great Plains, and so many more. Imagine you're ordering a hormone panel for a patient that includes tests from three different labs. You have to log onto three different websites, place separate orders, come back weeks later to check on tracking numbers, download results, et cetera, et cetera. Rupa eliminates all of that by having all ordering, tracking results in a single place, and they also handle invoicing, uh, tracking shipments, automated follow-ups, personalized instructions for completing tests, and much more. The best part about Rupa is that it is free for you. Go to rupahealth.com, that's R-U-P-A health.com, and join a live demo or sign up to see how it works. Now let's get back to today's show. So there are caveats within it that need to be discussed with what it can and can't do for us. And we have to sit down with our physician if we're really like not sleeping, we're always, always tired, brain fog, um, really bad vasomotor symptoms, anxiety, depression. There are th- therapies that you can use. And if they're not working, then yeah, 
try menopause hormone therapy. It's there as a therapy to help. It's not there as a stopgap. It's not a pharmaceutical that you know has been advertised in Europe as uh, stopping female deficiency hormone. Um, I guess what were they calling it? syndrome, or they're calling perimenopause a disease. It's not about that. It's a therapy, and it's there to be used when and if you need it. But also, don't make that the first step either, because there are other things that you can do. You can do training and nutrition interventions. You can try venaflaxine, which is an SSRI for vasomotor symptoms. You can definitely look at using some adaptogens. And again, if all that still is not enough, then yeah, add it in. I think it's a, a point that I want to underline that it's not going to change body composition. It's not, you know, we still need to get in there and do this and do the effort. Yeah. Especially for the visceral fat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what should, let's move on to another conversation that, that you've had quite a bit, um, what we should be eating. And I want to start first, because we're, we're talking about uh, workouts, muscle, um, with protein, you yeah. know, another really huge topic lately. We just wrote a blog about it on MySpace, but just a lot of conversations around it. Either you need to drop protein like a stone because protein causes cancer. Um, I think that that's been challenged or you need to, you know, eat your weight in protein. I mean, what do we, what, what do we, we women, again, peri and postmenopausal or, or peri, meno, and post need to be thinking about with regard to protein? Yeah, so we become more anabolically resistant as our hormones start to change. And specifically, it's the, ana, um, the anabolic response to building muscle, right? So we're looking at estrogen, like I was explaining earlier, really helps with lean mass development. When yeah. we're looking at doing all the heavy resistance training and the high intensity work, we need to follow that with good amounts of protein in order to, to complement that stress, to really get the responses of lean mass development. So for women who are in their early to mid forties, we're really looking at that. I'm sorry, I'm in metric, but I'll try to convert around <laughs> that 0.8 to one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Okay. And we want to evenly divide that. So we're looking at 30 to 40 grams at each meal, around 15 grams at each snack. And training becomes part of that as well. So if we're looking at um, doing our training in the morning, then maybe we're splitting our breakfast protein before and after. But it's really essential that women are keeping that amino acid coming up and circulating. One, because we have a higher amount of amino acid um, use and oxidation when we're getting into the sympathetic state because our body's like looking for fuel. We also know that we need to have more to increase the leucine threshold within the muscle so that we are actually getting that lean mass development and that strength development. And if we're looking at the literature on aging as well, they're showing that women who are eating more protein have better lean mass and they have better quality of life. Same with older men. So it's the protein intake that becomes a really, like you said, it's a polarizing story because of a few people who've come out and said, no, it causes cancer. But if you're looking at specifically what's happening from the whole body response to exercise and protein, yeah, you're going to have an increase in the mTOR signaling, but that's reparation. So you need the protein to come in to help repair and build the muscle. Right. So yeah, I'm like, mm, I really can't hang my hat on some of those. Don't, you know, you really have to have a low protein diet when there's so many beneficial mechanisms that come with having that equitable, at least 0.8 grams per pound of body weight, just right. as your baseline. And that translates to like about 1.7 to 2.4 grams per, per kilogram. kilogram. Yeah. Okay. Which is right up there with, with, you know, a, an athlete protocol. So you're not yeah. you're not backing off with protein recommendations at all. And you mentioned um, leucine. So you're talking about the branched chain amino acids. What sources of protein are um prior, are are the are the top are the ones that you would recommend? But it depends on what people like and eat. I mean. 
you have the whole plant-based aspect and people like, I'm just using legumes and seeds and pea protein isolates. And then you have the animal side of things where you're getting all sorts of protein from all different animal stuff. And that's fine. It's whatever your choice is, but you really want to make sure that it's high quality protein. So if you are vegan, then you're looking for your peas and your seeds and your nuts and your tempeh. Tofu is kind of iffy because of some of the effects that it has on women uh, from a phytoestrogen effect. But yeah, just really go after that high quality protein intake. And you can look at superfoods too, like spirulina. It's a really good source of iron and protein. So mm-hmm. you're like, oh, okay, I'll add that in. And then if you're um, more from an om- omnor- omnivorous, I guess, so you're eating plants and animals, then yeah, don't be afraid to eat lean beef. Don't be afraid to eat um, wild caught fish. You know, so yeah, just make sure that it's high quality. Um, you so you can achieve uh, those numbers, those you know pretty high numbers, one point seven to two point four grams per kilogram, using plant based sources without a yep. problem. Awesome. Yep, absolutely. I mean, full disclosure, I've been vegan since I was 14. And so I did my whole race career and everything through it. Uh, I do supplement um, with whey protein isolate when I'm traveling, because it's really hard when you're in airports and stuff to find good quality vegan food. Uh, But it's totally possible. I mean, you look, it's like you have your, your seeds and um, your nuts and your oatmeals and your sprouted grain breads plus your quinoa and your buckwheat and all those things, they all have protein in it. Mm-hmm. Fabulous. That's great news. That's great news. I mean, I'm, I, I'm an omnivore, but certainly plenty of, of people who are really leaning heavily in plant-based um, yeah. are uh, interested in this and then, sh- and should have this available. Um, so good news. That's good news that you've been doing it and you functioned as, as an elite athlete following a vegan protocol. Hi, New Frontiers listeners. Even though I will always believe in a diet first approach, I also regularly take supplements and I prescribe them to my patients. Yes, I think supplements are vital to plug in any holes or for greater impact where it's needed. If you are looking for my specific recommendations for the best most trusted brands out there for products like choline and protein, uh, the correct nutrients for vegans and vegetarians, head on over to drcarafitzgerald.com and click on store. You will find what you're looking for. Now back to the podcast. Um, what else do I want to ask you? Protein or, well, I wanted to, I have a couple questions. So we want to be eating that we want to, we want to bathe our body in um, amino acids, like post event before the, before we go and work out and then after. So we're not working out in a fasted state. So I want to, so when are we taking our protein? Do we ease up on protein when we're not in an intense uh, day, a demanding um, resistance training day? So there's that question, how uh, we drop it down a little bit. And then um, the whole fasting piece. So fasting, as you know, it's really popular right now. And people are doing some pretty uh, restrictive structures. We generally in our practice do more, more gentle interventions, maybe 12 on, 12 off, which I think is- Which is, is normal. Which is normal eating, yeah. basically. Normal eating. So what are your thoughts? A handful of questions there to you. Yeah. Okay. So I'll start with the fasting part and then we'll get into the protein part. So with fasting, if we're looking specifically at the hypothalamus, and when we're talking about the hypothalamus in the brain, it's where the energy sensing neurons are. So it's appetite control, it's endocrine function. And specifically, we look at the KISS-1 gene, KISS-peptin. And when women do fasted training or they stay in a breakdown state post-exercise by not eating, it uh, downturns our kisspeptin neurons. So what that does is it skews our appetite hormones. It also signals some thyroid dysfunction, and it also stops luteinizing hormone pulse after a few weeks. 
because the brain is like, hey, wait, there is not enough nutrition coming in to support all of my functions, let alone if I were to get pregnant. So when we look at perimenopause, you're still having some ovarian function and you're having a skew of our hormones, but you're still having that sensitivity. Plus you're in this tired, but wired increased sympathetic state. So if you are going to exercise in a fasted state, you're driving cortisol up. And for driving cortisol up, that again, stimulates that sympathetic drive and a breakdown state, but it's yeah. not breakdown of fatty acids. No. It's a breakdown of lean mass because the first thing that goes when your body is under a kind of a starvation threat is lean mass because it's highly energetic, but it also has a whole bunch of building blocks in it that the body's going to take and use in other places. So it is an appetite control and it's a body composition thing. And we know from research that having a little bit of food on board before we do any kind of training amplifies that adaptation response and also keeps the body in check so it doesn't stay in a catabolic state, which is that breakdown of lean mass. To put it in simpler terms, if we're looking at thresholds of calorie intake before we start seeing a lot of dysfunction, for women, we sit around 30 calories per kilogram of fat-free mass, but for men, it's 15. So men can get away with so much less before they get perturbance. So this is why we see a lot of the fasting um, exercise literature and fasting literature being so robust because it's all been done in men. There have been a few fasting studies done postmenopausal women, but it's been in sedentary, obese postmenopausal women. And yes, they have lost body fat, but so does calorie restriction. And there's a really, really cool article that came out in Nature about a month ago that was looking at um, circadian rhythm and um, really investigating. It was, I think it was like 300 people between the ages of 25 and 60, both men and women, and looking at when they ate. And for those people who didn't eat until noon and then they stopped eating at six or seven at night, which is a typical eating window, they had a a feedback mechanism that made them store more fat. Whereas people who ate earlier on in the day didn't have that same response. So they were able to lose weight with some calorie restriction, depending on the time of the calorie restriction. So when they're looking at how do we maximize health and, and weight loss, it's eating when the body needs it, which is during the day and not eating at night when the body is in its big reparation and sleep phase. Sure. So we see all of these different patterns of like, you know, 20 and four, 20 hours of not eating four hour window to eat. What yeah. are you eating in that window? Right. And, know, right, right? right. and it's not about putting in as many calories. It's the quality and it's the timing. Right. And we yeah. need to be able to fuel our bodies when it's under stress. And there's a lot of literature now coming out showing that if you're looking to lose weight, a slight calorie restriction in the evening is so much better than doing this fasted stuff. You're still going to get telomere length change if you're not eating and having that 12 and 12, like you say, which is normal eating. So you're not eating after dinner and then you have breakfast. You have all of those changes that happen overnight, which is normal. And that's what we're after. But we've gotten so far removed about what is normal eating, when are calories available, yeah. that people need to be retaught how to eat. Right, right, right. Well, and especially it sounds like women, because especially. we are a lot, a lot of us are engaging in, in, in pretty restrictive um, fasting structures these days, you know, time, time restricted eating or just plain fasting, full fasting. Yeah. And there's been some really cool stuff coming out, looking at the timing for women versus uh, nutrient timing for men. So nutrient timing for women is uber important because of hormone and appetite control. And if we delay eating after exercise and we stay in this breakdown catabolic state that occurs from exercise, then the hypothalamus is perceiving that as low energy availability. So it starts to have that whole metabolic downturn, appetite suppression and misstep in our appetite hormones. Uh, we see sleep disturbances and a lot of things that can lead to relative energy deficiency in sport, even if you're not an, an elite athlete. I mean, we see this in... 50% of our recreational female athletes. So that's someone who goes to the gym three times a week, right? And they're not super intensive. 
Um, but for men, we're not seeing it the same. So we really need to push the message that fasting is not good for women. We need to fuel for the activity that we're doing, slight calorie restrictions. So don't eat after dinner. Don't you know have a midnight snack and then have breakfast. Awesome. And we want to, before we go and work out, we want to have a little protein on a board. We want to have some nutrition yeah, so on it's, board. And then if we're going to get up and do like a, a resistance training workout, right? You can have around 90 calories or 20 grams of protein before, you don't have to worry so much about carbohydrate and then have your real meal afterwards. If you're gonna do a cardiovascular session, then you add only 30 grams of carbohydrate to that. So, I mean, I'm always talking on podcasts and interviews and stuff that my go-to in the morning before I go to an early session is a protein fortified coffee where I have a double espresso cold brew from the night before. I put in some vanilla almond milk some protein, some shashandra. So I'm getting some carbohydrate. I'm getting some protein. I'm getting, ooh, wake up. And then I go do my session, come back and have breakfast. And right. it's, you know, it's not a lot and it's well, maybe 120 calories, but it doesn't sit heavy. It gives my body what it needs. It stimulates the hypothalamus to, hey, there's some nutrition coming on. It's not like getting up two hours before your workout to have a full meal. It's just a, something very small. And is it better to have a, more bioavailable protein source pre-event than um, a fast know, yeah. like a piece of chicken. <laughs> you could, but you know, egg whites. Yeah. Um, you could have some yogurt if you want. So it doesn't have to be something again, something super heavy. Good. Um, all right. What else do I want to talk to you about? I think we're we're you know, we can, we're really at our end here, but it's just been a great conversation. Just so interesting, so provocative, so important, really revolutionary because we have, we've been really looking, we've been looking at men's literature, but, um, or science conducted in men, uh, talk to me about just some of the other lifestyle pieces. I don't, I, we don't have the time to go in depth, but, you know, sleep, uh, you know, meditation or some kind of a, a stress management protocol, just some of the other way up there, uh, important things that we want to be doing as women. Yes, sleep is really important. And we see so many sleep disturbances in women. And a lot of it, again, is hormone and stress driven. So um, to coin Andrew Huberman, non-sleep deep rest. So also yoga nidra, it's ways of right. meditation, right? So these are really good ways of finding ways to activate our parasympathetic response. If we can activate parasympathetic, it doesn't have to be right before bed, but different periods throughout the day, then it feeds forward to better sleep through, through the night. We get better slow wave sleep. We get more REM sleep, even if it's a short duration. So it's really important to take those 10 minutes of breath. So it could be, oh, I'm really stressed out. I just need to get outside for 10 minutes and I'm going to just focus on what the breeze feels like on my face. And just taking that deep breath in, exhale, and really just settling in the moment. And I sound very yogi when I do that, but I'm not yogi. I'm just talking about how, you know, we just need to reset so that we have that moment of calm, which helps downgrade that sympathetic drive that so many women are under all the time. Right. And then we can learn to tap back into that. So if we're going to bed and we can't sleep, we wake up in the middle of the night and we're like, oh, I can't get back to sleep. You focus back on that 10 minutes of what does that breeze feel like? How did my skin feel? And it just brings you back to that moment, which then triggers your body to get back into that parasympathetic. Right. Which ultimately, you know, at our beginning of our conversation discussing muscle mass, et cetera, is going to help preserve it. And exactly. Yeah. It's like a real good feed forward cycle. Yeah. Well, Dr. Sims, I just want to thank you so much for making time for us today and just moving through this really important science. It's going to it's going to, it's going to generate a ton of conversation, I think, for um, Excellent. our platform. And yeah, and we'll come back. We'll have this conversation. We'll, we'll, we'll have a part two when our kids start getting a little bigger. <laughs> that would be great. We start talking about puberty then when our kids are bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks. As always, thank you for listening to New Frontiers in Functional Medicine, where because of my sponsors, I am able to bring you the best minds in functional medicine. And of course, today is no exception. Not everybody can be a sponsor on my platform. So I appreciate the good work, the relentless research, and the generous support from my friends at Rupa Health, Biotics Research, and Integrative Therapeutics. These are brands I know and trust in my own clinic, and I can confidently recommend them to you. 
visit them at rupahealth.com, bioticsresearch.com, and integrativepro.com. And please let them know that you learned about them on New Frontiers. And if it's not too much to ask, I would really appreciate a thumbs up or a kind review wherever you're listening to New Frontiers. Thanks.